um, welcome everybody. It's a um, great pleasure to um, introduce um, Tony Wiscore um, from Stanford um, to give our seminar this morning. Tony obtained a PhD um, from University of Bern in 1992 and did work in a number of places, including UCSF, before moving to Stanford, where he has been located for, I guess, almost two decades. Um, and he has positions um, at Stanford and at the VA. And um, <clears throat> Tony has done terrific work um, on several themes, um, looking at the roles of um, immune and injury responses in neurodegeneration. Um, importantly, how aging through many of these factors and also um, through Alzheimer's disease. And he's used a number of different um, pioneering approaches, um, including um, animal models, um, genetic approaches, and large-scale um, omics, including proteomics. Um, he's received many honors and awards. If I go through all of them, I'll be cutting into his time for talking. So um, <clears throat> with that, um, it's a great pleasure then to um, invite Tony to um, <clears throat> bring us up to date about um, some of on aging and regulation of degeneration. Thank you, Doc. Um, thank you all for having me. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be in San Diego again. I, I came as a postdoc to Scripps, so um, San Diego is very dear to me. One of our daughters was born there. Um, but I know it's only virtual. So um, disclosures. Our lab is interested in understanding how the brain becomes susceptible to cognitive dysfunction, neurodegeneration, and diseases such as Alzheimer's disease with aging. And the idea that age is a key driver of uh, neurodegeneration is, of course, not new. And this um, slide here visualizes that aging is a key risk factor for actually a large part of uh, diseases in, in our society. And it's estimated that at least half uh, of over 65 year olds have two or more conditions that are clearly uh, driven by the aging process itself. And you can see here um, how each one of these diseases sort of increases the percentage in the population that has one, two, three, or up to eight different age-related diseases. And the approach to um, deal with this problem has been to develop individual treatments for, uh, for diseases, such as heart disease, diabetes, and so forth. But um, a growing sort of um, uh, drive in, in the research field, and that comes really from the process of trying to understand aging, has proposed to uh, try to understand the aging process and actually target itself uh, in a therapeutic way. And the idea would be to slow down or reverse aspects of aging by understanding the molecular processes that underlie aging in what is often called uh, rejuvenation. And this is of course, not a new idea. This has been a dream of uh, humans um, since recorded history, probably. This is just one example of a painting from Lucas Granach, the elder in the 16th century, who shows here a fountain of youth that would uh, rejuvenate people. So they enter old and frail on one side and emerge young and rejuvenated on the other. Of course, we know um, this is not um, uh, reality. Uh, it's not close to within reach, I think, for humans. But what is really uh, amazing is that there are um, a growing number of interventions in uh, animal models uh, and most uh, excitingly, I think, in, in mouse models, in complex uh, mammalian uh, organisms uh, that show that um, interventions can, that target the aging process can indeed slow down or reverse it and rejuvenate these animal at multiple levels from molecules to cells, tissues, and most importantly, function. And I just list a few here, metabolic interventions such as caloric restriction, exercise, um, uh, small molecules that target uh, specific processes of aging, removal of senescent cells, 
One of the hottest topics may be transient epigenetic reprogramming um, of age cells, so whereby you activate the Yamanaka transcription factors that allow you to transform an adult cell into an induced pluripotent stem cells by activating these transcription factors only for a short period of time and turn them basically on and off. What people discovered is that um, this does not put the, the cell back to a stem cell, but rather makes it younger and erases some of these age-related epigenetic marks uh, that people have described. And then treatment with young blood is something that we have been working on that just sort of highlighting the, um, the hype, if you will, in this, in this field. And this is actually uh, Juan Carlos Belmonte who is uh, at the SOLC has been uh, really a driver uh, in this process. Sorry, he's at UCSD or no stalk. Um, he, had, he has been really a driver of this uh, field and uh, of epigenetic transient reprogramming. And um, this has uh, contributed, I think, in large part to this uh, absolutely incredible um, investment of $3 billion in, into Altos Labs to try to harness this concept and uh, see what this can be applied to the treatment of age-related diseases um, and, um, and even slow down the aging process uh, to increase uh, health span. Now, um, Juan Carlos was actually quoted that within two decades, we will be able to prevent aging. I don't think that's what he really said, but it just shows um, sort of the excitement that um, uh, exists in this field. Now we have been working on, um, as I said, on trying to understand the role of the systemic environment in regulating the aging process. And we did this by using a model called parabiosis. And this was really um, inspired by work from uh, Tom Rando, who in, um, in recent years revived this model to study stem cell aging. So Tom was interested in uh, aging of the muscle and with age, the muscle does not rejuvenate uh, as a young muscle does if you um, extend it, exert it uh, excessively, or if you injure it. And what uh, Tom was able to show is that if uh, these old stem cells in the muscle are exposed to a young environment, a systemic circulatory environment from a young mouse, then the muscle would regenerate and, uh, and basically almost uh, histologically look like a young muscle. He also saw similar effects in the liver and uh, noted that in the brain there was increased proliferation of cells in the hippocampus and that was the basis of a collaborative um, project uh, with our lab uh, over several years that showed that indeed um, young blood can uh, slow down and reverse aspects of aging as I'll show you in a minute. Um, others have shown similar effects in an increasing number of tissues in the mouse. And uh, this has been re reproduced by many different labs. So again, here the concept is that through this surgical model called parabiosis, there's a shared um, blood system, circulatory system, a capillary network um, that allows blood from the young animal to enter the old organism and vice versa. We were also able to show for the first time that you actually don't need the surgical model, but you can collect plasma from um, young animals and repeatedly infuse it into old mice and uh, reproduce uh, many of the effects that you see with parabiosis. And this was um, in the lab really pioneered by Saul Vileda, who's now an associate professor at UCSF. And Saul could show at the time that either with this model of parabiosis or by repeatedly infusing plasma so we actually need only the liquid fraction of the blood repeatedly infusing this over three weeks every three days into old mice that this increases neural stem cell activity increases synaptic plasticity uh, and i think very importantly reduces brain inflammation uh, throughout the uh, the brain but specifically also in the vasculature and it led to, most importantly, to an improvement in memory. And again, many other labs have been able to uh, replicate these findings. 
um, and also show uh, even in vitro, Tom Sudov showed that iPS derived neurons benefit from exposure to young plasma factors as compared to old plasma. Um, what's also very interesting is that if you um, sort of do the opposite and you take plasma from old mice into young, you can actually accelerate the aging process and um, get the opposite effects um, that you get with young blood. You reduce neurogenesis, synaptic plasticity, you impair memory function, and you uh, increase inflammation in microgliastrocytes and again, uh, prominently also in the vasculature. And people have uh, identified a number of different proteins that mediate some of these effects. They're listed here, positive factors or negative factors that can accelerate aging. But I think the field accepts sort of that there is not a single factor um, and that there are uh, probably many different types of processes. And I'll get to that a little bit uh, in a minute. Uh, because plasma is, has been used in humans as a, as a treatment, uh, whether it's uh, during surgery, with, uh, if you have uh, blood loss, but also uh, different fractions of plasma have been used uh, in the treatment of uh, different types of deficiencies or uh, antibodies are purified from plasma for um, people with immunodeficiency, transplants, um, it, it became sort of um, obvious to try whether this would work in humans. Um, it's a safe treatment. And I'll just list here uh, two studies. Um, one uh, from the company that we've started, Alcahest, where um, we treated patients with uh, mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. This was a dose range finding study. It didn't have a placebo arm, uh, but we got um, uh, encouraging result uh, uh, functionally in patients. If we compared uh, this to historic placebo controls, of course, this is not um, you know, a, a final result, but it's again, it's encouraging. And we have also proteomic data that suggests that there is indeed a uh, rejuvenating effect to some extent that we also see in mice. And then this study here uh, that was done by Griffles, um, which uh, acquired uh, Alcas recently. And Griffles has been working on this idea for, for a, numbers of he a number of years, initially with the idea to remove amyloid from the periphery, from this, this concept of the peripheral sink that amyloid accumulates in the blood and if you removed it uh, it would be beneficial for patients they did um, a study where patients with alzheimer's disease are treated initially um, what's called apheresis where so again you remove um, aged plasma from these patients and then they give them back an albumin fraction which is rich in growth factors so it contains several hundred other proteins but is 99% albumin. And what they could show is um, in a, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, which was published a couple of years ago, that um, these patients show significant clinical benefits on disease progression, memory, daily functioning, um, and uh, suggesting that there is uh, indeed something in uh, this plasma fraction, this albumin fraction that is beneficial. I should say that the plasma from which this um, uh, uh, that from uh, the donors that uh, provide this plasma or donate this plasma, they are um, typically um, an average age of 35 years. So this is really young plasma. So essentially what this uh, study did is remove age plasma and give a young plasma fraction. And again, this suggests that there are benefits that uh, can be translated from mice to humans. Now, um, as a scientist, of course, you want to know how does this work? This seems to be too, too, too good to be true. So how does young blood potentially rejuvenate the organism? What are the factors? Where do they come from? Which cell types does young blood actually rejuvenate? How do the factors reach the brain? Um, and that got us sort of thinking more globally about the aging process. Do tissues actually age in synchrony? Do cells age in synchrony? Or are some cells and tissues age faster 
in um, in in a given individual uh, than other cells, and very much related to that, if we ever want to apply a treatment that is based on the aging process, we need to be able to measure aging. Like if you want to treat hypertension, you have to be able to measure blood pressure. If we want to treat aging, we have to be able to measure it in a reliable way. And um, because tissues and cells age in different um, sort of trajectories, we need to be able to measure the age of a specific tissue. So um, one of the questions that uh, we wanted to know is how do cells and tissues age across the organism in an attempt to understand where would these factors that um, are potentially rejuvenating or age promoting, where are they being produced? Where do they come from? And this was a, a project from graduate student Nick Sharma at the time who, um, took sort of initially a, a somewhat um, naive approach uh, looking back where we thought if we just um, uh, measured a transcriptome of every tissue in, in mice, uh, we will be able to figure out where these factors are produced. Now, a lot of factors are produced in many different tissues. And so it turned out to be much more challenging, but it led to, I think, a very interesting and um, uh, useful uh, tool that we developed together with Steve Quake, who um, became the, the co-director of the Chan Zuckerberg uh, initiative and had these resources available to really make this a, a major project. We recruited about 18 faculty at Stanford with different uh, tissue uh, knowledge. And we made these atlases where at the single cell level, we basically profiled um, every uh, major tissue um, and, and, and measured the transcriptome of these cells that led to the single cell transcriptomic atlas of the mouse. And then we looked at how these tissues, how the transcriptomes at the cellular level changes with age. And that uh, really provided a lot of very exciting and interesting insight. Um, I think one of the principal ones is that aging is not a linear process. It's also not a synchronized process ac across the organism. So you can see this here, for example, in gonadal adipose tissue, you have your mice from one month to 27 months of age, and these are hundreds um, or sometimes thousands of genes that we were made, able to measure. Um, this is bulk um, RNA sequencing, so the whole tissue, but we have this also at the individual cell level for all these, uh, for over hundred cell types. And you can see that the process, um, how these genes change with age is not linear. And it starts very early on. And you can, of course, debate whether this is aging or still development. Um, but clearly with age, there are dramatic changes and they're different in different tissues. So here we look at downregulated and upregulated genes, again, from young to old in all these different tissues. And you can appreciate that some tissues show relatively few changes with age and others show just massive changes with genes going up several fold from young to old fat tissues. Interestingly, the skin showing uh, major changes with age. And again, they don't change all in synchrony. Um, uh, leading uh, the field and uh, from many different organisms over the years to really conclude that aging is asynchronous at the tissue and cellular level. The, the trajectories of aging are not uh, linear and they um, are to some extent stochastic, but some of this is probably also genetically encoded. And so um, in just a, a simple cartoon form, um, you can uh, of course divide um, lifespan of an organism into these principal um, time frames of development, reproductive phase and post-reproductive phase. And I think while initially people thought sort of aging is something that happens mostly in the post-reproductive phase, we really see that the aging processes um, continue to take place throughout um, a lifespan. And uh, again, different tissues undergo much more dramatic changes at different times uh, during life. 
So which cell types does young blood uh, rejuvenate? And um, this is some. This is sort of the, the third uh, project that we took out of this um, tabula Morris effort, where we actually took down the mice all at the same time now, five years ago, um, for single cell analysis of just young mice, of aged mice, and then of this uh, parabiosis model. And uh, what we typically use here is we use uh, normal aging sort of as a ground truth, uh, young and old mice. And then we have uh, in the parabiosis model, we have pairs of young mice, pairs of old mice, they're called isochronic. And then we have these heterochronic pairs where a young mouse is exposed to old. Uh, we call this accelerated aging paradigm. So how does the young, how do old factors uh, influence and potentially accelerate the aging process in young organisms. And then the old mouse exposed to young, looking at rejuvenation, what are the genes that are uh, changed um, in a um, rejuvenating direction? So reversing uh, the tra trajectory of aging. And um, just a few highlights from this study. Um, when you just look at normal aging first um, and sort sort of uh, by one measure that you can use how many genes change um, in uh, given cell types uh, you can sort them and you see that um, most cells show dramatic changes over um, uh, sort of until medium age of, of um, 18 months in mice which would be an equivalent of about 65 years in people um, and uh, they they really all change quite dramatically uh, with with age. If we look at um, the heterochronic mice, either the young mouse exposed to old blood, um, we we see um, many genes that uh, change. Again, you see thousands of genes uh, sometimes changing, um, and and now we get a different sort of. Um, uh, a different ranking, if you will, uh, of cells that are most affected by this aged environment. Interesting, many types of endothelial cells in different tissues are at the top here, consistent with the idea that blood is the main driver of this, and um, endothelial cells would be the first cells to be exposed to an aged environment. And so many of these genes are actually consistent with the normal aging process. And then um, when we look at which genes are most, of, uh, which cells are most affected by a uh, young environment, we see um, interestingly stem cell types um, being uh, most dramatically affected, such as hematopoietic stem cells, uh, stromal cells, um, suggesting that these cells are indeed susceptible to the environment, to the circulatory environment. And when we look specifically at how many genes are changed um, in the opposite direction in the rejuvenation paradigm, um, we see that, um, that um, again, hep hepatocytes, for example, and stem cells are the ones that um, show clearly um, changes that reverse the, the trajectory of aging. So what we look at here is the percentage of genes that um, show the same change as you see with normal aging. And uh, so this would be a consistent aging process. So we really mimic aging here in these uh, type of cells. And then here we reverse the trajectory of genes that would normally go up. We reverse them so they go down again um, or vice versa. And uh, here again, hepatocytes are the most susceptible cells but then also a number of different stem cells. We wanted to know what are the key pathways that are responsible uh, or are driving these processes. And uh, what we see is that um, in the accelerated aging paradigm, uh, for example, in fat stromal cells, that um, changes in extracellular matrix, um, upregulation of matrix, uh, genes involved in matrix formation, is one of the key hallmarks uh, of this accelerated aging paradigm. And this is consistent with what people have postulated to be a major hallmark uh, of aging. 
And then uh, equally exciting, if we look at the rejuvenation paradigm in hepatocytes, again, these are um, one of the most susceptible cell types to a young systemic environment with many genes going um, back to uh, an earlier age, if you will. And here, um, uh, mitochondrial electron transport respiration is one of the key pathways, again, consistent with a lot of studies by many different labs over the past uh, decades um, that suggest that mitochondria um, are one of the key sort of mitochondrial aging is one of the key hallmarks um, of the aging process. And so it's really reassuring to see that with this uh, intervention, with exposure to young blood, to young plasma, we can reverse uh, some of these um, hallmarks of mitochondrial aging um, across actually many different cell types. So if we look at which pathways are most dramatically changed, um, across the whole organism, it's mitochondrial electron transport. You can also look at this um, in a um, uh, sort of uh, overview of all the major cell types that we have looked at in the different cells and ask what are, um, what are the key um, changes that, that you can see with aging, for example. And so here um, in this uh, graph that we call the Picasso plot, um, we, we show with uh, the size of the dots, um, the number of genes that change with age in each cell type. So the larger the dot, the more genes change with age. And the lines that collect the cell types show that the similarity in the top genes that change with age. So we see across the organism, in individual cell types, common signatures of aging. So some cells really share the same transcriptional pro, uh, process as they age. And what's really interesting is um, if you um, look at this across different cell types and tissues, you see, for example, that um, stromal cells or endothelial cells across many different tissues show a concerted sort of aging signature, suggesting that this is driven by the cell type itself. Um, whereas um, in, uh, in other cells, uh, you see that across different cell types, they show common signatures of aging uh, in a given tissue, such as the skin or the pancreas, suggesting that here, um, there may be an environment uh, that promotes the aging process and triggers sort of similar genes that change. That's of course only one interpretation, but it's interesting that we see these sort of signatures that allow you potentially to find out what are the key pathways that make up these signatures and can we intervene um, with um, therapeutic approaches potentially to slow down or reverse these processes. You can also look at this um, in the accelerated aging or rejuvenation paradigm. And you see that some of these um, age-related um, common signatures persist and some of them uh, form new sort of common signatures of aging or rejuvenation. Um, another study that recently took a similar approach looked at um, caloric restriction in, uh, in the rat. And they uh, looked specifically at um, young and old rats that had um, had libitum food, so they, they could eat as much as they want and the rats become slightly obese as they get old. And then the caloric restriction ones, and they looked also at the single cell level in um, six different tissues, whether they can find sort of common signatures. And they could, again, like we did uh, find that cells really respond in individual ways to these um, uh, environments, uh, they could show accumulation of pro-inflammatory cells in various tissues and that caloric restriction attenuates aging associated cell type specific gene expression changes. And it will be really interesting, I think, to move forward um, to look what are sort of common signatures of um, accelerated aging or um, more importantly here, comparing it to caloric restriction of rejuvenation. So if we looked at rejuvenation with caloric restriction, exposure to young blood, 
uh, uh, transient epigenetic reprogramming or exercise, can we find common signatures of rejuvenation, if you will, and can these become sort of key new targets to intervene in the aging process and again, increase health span and prevent some of these um, uh, devastating age-related diseases. So um, one of the um, important questions uh, in, in trying to understand the aging process um, is of course, what are the factors? And then, uh, as I said earlier, um, how can we uh, measure the aging process? So again, if you think about this, why would this potentially work? The, the blood is really the tissue that connects all the other organs in our bodies and, and is not just um, a carrier of, um, of cells, of the immune system and of, of gases like oxygen and CO2, but it's really um, a carrier of um, information, if you will, um, between information ex that allows exchange between tissues. So for example, um, we talked about exercise. Exercise is beneficial for many different tissues, it's beneficial for the brain. So um, there are now studies that show from, from Solvilleta's lab and from, from our lab, but also from many others earlier, that if you exercise, for example, mice, you can take their blood, you can inject it, infuse it into um, a non-exercise mouse, and you can reproduce some of the benefits of exercise, suggesting that the exercise effect, or at least part of it, is indeed in the blood. There must be factors in the blood that um, can confer this effect. And what interestingly both Saul's lab and our lab found is that we identified each uh, one protein that mimics sort of some of these effects in plasma and both of these proteins um, are liver derived suggesting that the muscle first talks to the liver and then the liver produces a factor into the blood that is beneficial for the brain. But this is just one example of, I think, um, uh, of showing us how tissues really communicate through the blood. And we can now measure thousands or even 10,000 different proteins in the blood and start to quantify this physiological or pathophysiological communication between tissues. And so we can ask, how does the blood change with age at a molecular uh, level? What is the composition of the blood as an organism changes? And this is sort of an extension, of course, of what we use in, in clinical medicine. If you go to the doctor, um, they, they, they take a blood sample and measure all kinds of metabolites or proteins that tell us whether your uh, organism is healthy or not, um, whether specific tissues are healthy or not. But you can expand that to a much broader, um, I think, to obtain much broader insight into um, molecular processes, cellular processes of an organism. And so we started to do this um, probably 15 years ago or so with uh, platforms that were not too reliable. They had too much uh, background noise. Um, uh, we could not get really uh, reproducible data, but over the past um, five to 10 years, um, a couple of platforms have really um, been able to measure thousands of proteins now uh, very reliably and, and consistently reproducibly. And one, um, uses these uh, modified oligonucleotides. They're called aptamers, and the company calls them somomers. Um, uh, somologic is the company. And um, these function like antibodies, and the, actually the molecular um, uh, interface between a given protein and this aptamer has roughly the same footprint as an antibody interacting with uh, an antigen. And so we used this in collaboration with Neil Barcel and Sophia Milman at Einstein College and um, with data from the interval study at this healthy aging study in Europe, um, we were able to collect um, data from over 4,000 
uh, human plasma samples from people, healthy people aged 20 to almost 100. And uh, overall, we had uh, roughly 3,000 proteins that we were able to measure. And when you look at this sort of with a bird eyes uh, view, um, and you show on the x-axis here these 4,000 individuals, and, um, and then on the y-axis, the 3,000 proteins that we measured. So for each person, um, we, we list here the 3,000 proteins, and we use um, blue and yellow uh, shades um, of color to, to show the changes in relative levels of these proteins. So blue would be low levels of a protein, yellow high level. And you can see again, the dramatic changes in the composition of the blood in this cross-sectional studies from young to old people. Um, you can also appreciate that this is, again, it's not a linear process. Um, some proteins are young when you're uh, are low when you're young, they go up with age, some go the other direction. Um, but you also see changes that um, happen throughout um, lifespan. And you can actually, um, you can actually, excuse me, something's moving here. You can look at uh, these changes um, that occur at uh, different ages and you can add up the number of proteins that change at each um, age. So how many proteins are significantly different, let's say, between a person age 30, um, younger than 30, compared to a person older than 30? And if you do that, you see sort of waves of aging. The most prominent, if you squint your eyes, is around here at age 35, then another one at 60, and then the most prominent one at um, age 85. And this is shown here sort of Again, summing up the proteins that change at each given age in people younger compared to older uh, that age. And we use 10-year uh, intervals to, to calculate the number of significant proteins. And you see this very early wave of uh, aging in the composition of the plasma proteome another one at age 60, another one at uh, around age 80. We can actually see this in multiple completely independent cohorts um, with different platforms, with uh, the somologic platform and another antibody-based platform called Olink. Um, and you also see this at functional levels. So people have shown, for example, epigenetic changes that seem to peak around this age, um, around 60 and 80. Um, in the blood, uh, in immune cells in the blood, or even if you look at changes um, in function, cognitive changes, for example, um, uh, some of them show similar trajectories. We can look at each of these uh, waves or peaks. What are the proteins that change? And um, they are not the same. So uh, we see different types of proteins. And it's interesting that, again, um, some of these proteins are highly uh, enriched in uh, matrix related functions. And um, there's a lot of follow-up work to be done here to find out what exactly are these proteins doing and why do they change uh, so dramatically. But I want to get uh, now in the last few minutes to um, discuss uh, unpublished data um, that try to um, really measure aging based on this uh, insight that I've showed you before. And the fact that you get these dramatic changes with age and the plasma proteome, can you develop a, a model um, that correlates basically age um, with uh, levels of, of these different proteins? And so people have um, built what often times are called clocks um, with different types of molecular features that change with aging. And these include DNA methylation, facial features, telomere length, protein composition, metabolic changes, um, and so forth. And uh, maybe the most famous uh, of all these clocks is uh, the one from Steve Horvath that um, is based on changes in methylation pattern on the DNA. Um, and this allowed uh, Steve really to show um, for the first time that there are these changes with age that you can see in um, major tissues in humans, but also in, in any other organism. And based on these changes, you can then cal calculate in an unknown sample what the relative age is. 
And it has been suggested that the deviation from this predicted age has biological information. And so we wanted to apply this to try to understand brain aging um, or aging at, of any tissue for that matter, with the idea that if you find a protein in the blood and you can assign it to a specific tissue, you can potentially learn something about the physiology, the pathophysiology of this tissue or the aging process itself. And this is work carried out by two graduate students in the lab now. And so here the concept again is that if you look um, at an organism and um, we know now from uh, uh, sort of atlases of gene expression, which genes are expressed in which cell type or tissue, um, you can use this information to assign the, here we have actually 5,000 proteins. You can assign these proteins to um, a specific tissue. Now, most proteins, most genes are expressed ubiquitously, or at least a large number of them are, or they are expressed in many different tissues and cell types. So here we look specifically for those genes and proteins uh, for which the expression is enriched in a particular tissue. And out of these 5,000 proteins that um, uh, Soma Logica has on their platform, um, in this particular experiment, they will soon have 10,000 proteins they can measure. About 200 are highly enriched in the brain. So they're most likely brain derived. Um, and you can do this for all different tissues. You have liver specific proteins, blood specific proteins, and so forth. And because some of these change with age, we can now try to model the aging process for each tissue. And again, the way this works is you know the actual age of a person or an organism. And then um, you use the information of the changes and the proteome, for example, and you build a model. Uh, this is typically a regression model, a linear expression model most of the time, um, ENET or LASSO, um, that allows you to then uh, calculate the relative age you try to make basically model the, um, the age of a person. And what you get is a, a curve like that, where if you would uh, absolutely uh, specifically predict the age of a person, they would be falling on this line here. But for most people, you get some deviation from this prediction, what is called delta age or the age gap. So for example, this individual is predicted to be younger than um, their actual chronological age, while this person is predicted to be older than their um, actual age. And again, the idea is um, that this deviation contains biological information. So if the model says you're younger, then um, data, growing number of data in model systems, in, in animal models has shown that this is indeed associated with a function or with molecular changes in these tissues. And we can do this not just at the organism level, like most people have been doing, but because we have information again from these specific tissues, we can build clocks now for basically all major tissues um, as shown here. And so the way we, we did this is we have a healthy aging uh, cohort. We um, model the aging process with all the proteins uh, from a given tissue that we measure or for all, with all the tissues, what we call an organismal clock. Um, and then a brain clock, a kidney clock, a heart clock and so forth. And then we test, um, we validate these clocks in independent data set. Um, one again uh, from uh, near Barcelona and Sophia Milman at Einstein College, and then samples from our Alzheimer's Research Center here at Stanford, where we have a lot of clinical information, longitudinal follow up. Um, and we ask um, can we use this information, this prediction of uh, age, to uh, infer functional states? Um, can we derive biological information? 
And so the way uh, this looks like, so you get um, a correlation with, if you look all, the, if you use all the proteins, um, you get a very high correlation between age overall and uh, biological predicted age. And this is a lower with different tissues. But again, we're really interested in the variance between your actual chronological age and the predicted age. And so just as an example, first the heart. Um, so here are these individuals where we predict this is their actual age. And this is the predicted age and the deviation. Um, you could be younger at heart or older at heart, if you will. Um, we can um, extract which proteins make up this clock. So the heart clock is made up of only um, eight or so proteins. Interestingly, some of the key proteins that are already used um, to in the clinic to uh, look at the health of your heart, such as troponin and natriuretic uh, peptide, um, are uh, picked out of the bucket of all the proteins that we looked at, um, supporting the, the, the biological val validity of, of this model. But we have uh, many new proteins that have seem to have diagnostic properties here on heart aging. And if we look in these two different cohorts, we can show that um, people who are predicted to have um, an older heart are indeed um, uh, found to have uh, uh, atrial fibrillation or pacemakers in the ADRC, or they had heart attacks or bypass in the longevity cohort. So we did not, we trained our algorithm on healthy aging people, yet the prediction that somebody has an older heart is then associated in independent cohorts, indeed with heart disease. And if we look at this um, specifically at the longevity cohort, we have actually a 17 fold increased risk if you're in the top quartile of heart age to develop heart disease 15 years down the line. And oh, this is actually shown here. So um, we have here follow-up, the sample blood sample was obtained at time zero. And if we look at these people 10 or 15 years later, um, the bottom uh, heart age, so those predicted to have a young heart, they barely change, they have no um, uh, heart uh, related problems. The ones who are predicted to have an older heart, the top 25%, they indeed have uh, um, sorry, a 15-fold uh, increased risk to get uh, heart disease. And lastly, um, uh, similar studies with the brain. Here again, we can uh, model brain aging, uh, look at the bottom quartile, so those with young brains or the top quartiles, those with predicted to have older brains. When we look in our ADRC, out of 22 people with Alzheimer's disease, um, 18 are in the top brain ages and only four who are predicted to have a young brain uh, have Alzheimer's disease. And when we look uh, in uh, longitudinal follow-up, so blood was obtained at time zero, we follow these people now over five years, those to be uh, those with uh, young brains um, show relatively uh, stable cognition, whereas those predicted to have older brains, um, they show a seven-fold increase in cognitive decline here with CDR sum, two-point change as sort of a, a measurement. And we can, of course, use many other ways uh, to look at this, but um, consistent with uh, an increased susceptibility to cognitive decline. And what's also interesting, if you look at this sort of from a um, organismal perspective again, and we have the age of each tissue in a given person. On average, people without Alzheimer's disease, their tissues are mostly young, uh, whereas people with Alzheimer's disease, they have an, not only an older brain, but they also show accelerated heart muscle and aging of other tissues. And it will be interesting to see what are the proteins here. Of course, the link between heart disease and cognitive decline, um, dementia is, is well established. And it will be interesting to see what are the proteins that are making up these models and are they potentially related. 
So with that, I would like to thank uh, my lab, um, many collaborators um, who uh, were just uh, really tremendous uh, help in, in uh, carrying out some of these studies and then funding from, from all these sources. Thank you.